uh, this year our, our um, theme is climate, climate change and resiliency in the profound component. Um, tonight I wanted to introduce our speaker before I do that. I wanted to um, talk about the Badger Key Medicine, which is 130,000 acres south of the park, um, north, the northern part of the Helena Lewis and Clark National Forest. Um, we also, as the Badger Key Medicine Alliance, we also work um, in the Flathead National Forest and the park as well in the spirit of connectivity and corridors in this landscape. Um, in addition to policy and advocacy work, we host stewardship projects, and all of our stewardship projects are on the um, table. You'll see all these beautiful flyers. We have pasta. Um, we have our summer walks. They're free. They're, the registrations are open and rolling. Um, and the next event will actually be next Wednesday, May 31st. We're going to have a bear education event, and I really encourage if you know anyone who is a like a rental vacation owner, a vacation rental owner. Um, I will be passing out like free resources for those um, vacation rentals so we can get some better awareness um, spread around in the community. So please spread the word. Um, May 31st we'll have an event and then June 14th will be a second event. Um, so yeah, we're getting excited about that. Um, but tonight we have um, Daryl Center. We're really excited to have him. Um, he is a hydrologist for the Blackfeet Nation and was raised in the bad area of the Blackfeet Reservation. Here we are. And Harold has been fascinated by the fact that he is from the headwaters of the continent and has fostered his interest in river geomorphology, the water cycle, and fisheries by becoming a hydrologist along the backbone of the world. Um, Harold works with agencies and other partners to quantify the amount of water that flows to Blackfeet Nation. So without further ado, let's welcome Harold. For that lovely introduction, Jordan. <laughs> Appreciate you. Um, let's see. So, uh, let's get my slideshow going here. I figure out a. Do I have a laser pointer on there? Not that I don't think I need one. But I think you do. I can skip slides. Oh, I didn't know if that was powered, but I didn't want to do the thing. Uh, we'll be okay without a laser pointer. It's not going to be too many graphs and charts and. What not, but there'll be a couple. It's okay. Here we go. Okay. It's called the razor's edge or something like that. Drive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very cute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, see? Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You're welcome. Yeah, so um, as uh, Jordan said, I'm um, from the Chief Mountain area of the reservation here, uh, North Sider, and um, yeah, near the triple divide of the world, well, the continent anyways, North America, the headwaters of the world, backbone of the world, yeah. we're, we're up here uh, where, where the waters really divide, despite what Mission Mountain Woodman said there in that one song, huh? Mission Mountain, no, oh, triple divide, <laughs> and uh, so uh, yeah, today's uh, talk is um, going to focus um, a lot on climate adaptation and drought resiliency, but there's going to be uh, a lot of an overview of what's going on in the Blackfeet Water Department too, and that's what it'll start with, and then I'll, um, I'll kind of uh, switch gears slightly halfway through. So, um, just do that. Water Department for about a year and a little over a year now. Uh, before, prior to that, I was with the Pecunny Lodge Health Institute um, after receiving a hydrology degree. I have worked in the hydrology field in ways a lot throughout my life. Um, uh, guiding fishermen, my family um, out in Bab, we did a lot of outfitting. Um, and then I had some odd jobs where I was laboring on stream restoration. After that, I started uh, doing avalanche watch for the snow removal on uh, going to the Sun Road. And uh, that was where I met a gentleman who um, I was very interested in his job. They were the snow um, avalanche forecasters where I was just an avalanche watchman. 
And I was like, whoa, that's a cool job. I can do that. And so here they went to school at Bozeman School of Snow Science. And uh, I was like, I'm going to do that. And then I, but then the summer season, I loved so much. It was hard to leave August 15th to go to Bozeman. But say the Kootenai College starts about a month later. They're on a different system. So <laughs> that worked out better. I found an air hydrology program, jumped in there, and um, got it, came back, and, and there's good work here because the water compacts have gone through. A lot of the um, stuff that was going on at the time in 2015 was, um, you know, uh, Water's Life, that camp of uh, many walk in. Um, over there for the um, northern uh, North Dakota access pipeline was going on, so there was a lot of um, people interested in uh, protecting water. So um, also, um, CSKT took over the dam, formerly known as Kerr Dam, SKT now. Um, so I thought maybe there was jobs there, but um, but it worked out pretty good. Came back home, and yeah, it worked out really good. And uh, so here's the Blackfeet Reservation. Uh, a couple shots of it. You guys might have seen these before. I didn't make these. USGS made this one, and I can't remember who made that one, but yeah, here's some sites we have these red dots. I'll get into more, but yeah, the reservation's uh, about 2,285 square miles with uh, six major watersheds from St. Mary's down to Birch Creek here. Here's a slide. So, um, like I said, I worked for PLHI at County Lodge Health Institute prior to starting with the Blackfeet Water Department. So I've kind of got a mesh of things happening here. Although I did make this map uh, for PLHI, and um, here we have the Blackfeet Reservation outlined, and uh, you can see the Great Divide. People call it the Continental Divide, but there's a lot of Continental Divides. That's the Great Divide. This one, it's labeled on the map as Arctic Divide, but I think it's got a more technical name, like Marantia or yeah. something like that, yeah. And they meet here at Triple Divide Peak. So, uh, so yeah, here we are at the headwaters of the world. And when I was with PLHI, I was uh, doing some work where we do uh, some outreach too and trying to uh, uh, work with students and uh, young people and get them to realize Exactly the significance of our geographical location on the continent, or on the continent. Yeah. So this map is a helpful uh, tool to show that. So uh, here's a quick overview slide of things that I'm going to go over. Um, most of these are water department related, and I'll dedicate a good uh, chunk of time to the final uh, part here, climate adaptation, but. Mainly what I'm doing, honestly, is this measurement program, but doing, doing all of these things, irrigation, permitting, um, cooperative studies, database mapping, outreach, uh, St. Mary's version of four harms we do a little bit with, and uh, climate adaptation. This picture here, uh, can anyone guess where that is? Go ahead and shout it out. Yep, coolest gate, one of the oldest data sets in the country right there, and that's where we uh, measure at, is right below the bridge there. And the gauge house and the stilling well is uh, just across the bridge. You guys have probably all seen that rock structure around it. That's the stilling well so for this gauge. So this is the right that we go toward the motel? Yeah. The mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yep. So this acts as a control right here, this pile of rocks. And, uh, and then we'll measure right along here with our uh, flow tracker. There's these two sensors on it right there. And uh, you take and you divide your stream into sections, and uh, you got to capture around 5% in each section you do. So if it's one section, you divide it by 20 to capture 5%, you might catch more than 5% in these middle sections. So you, a good rule of thumb might be 25 sections. And you take this and sit it in there for 40 seconds at each one, and it'll compute it how much cubic feet per second. Seconds going by based on velocity, and it'll compute the area as you go. And then right at the end, you complete it. And that's how you use those things. But yeah, our measurement program, uh, a lot of it's been uh, assisting with different agencies uh, during the field, the field work that they do is they come to the reservation. Um, USGS mainly, 
but a lot of our work is with the DNRC as well. Um, Climate Change and Mountain Ecosystems Group is what who this CGME is. They're USGS as well out of West Glacier, and they're the guys that do the avalanche uh, forecasting that made me want to go back to school. <laughs> so I still have a relationship with them, and we have uh, some plans coming up, and we've worked together since uh, I've come on with the trad. USIS is um, the Army Corps of Engineers, US, and um, they've got a lot of funding right now for some uh, weather stations, and they're they're putting them up. They've already got plans for them, actually. Um, they put a grid over the whole entire country, or actually just the upper Missouri River Basin, um, and we're the top left of that, top left of the Great Plains. And, um, and uh, yeah, so they broke it into a 25 by 25 mile grid, and four of those grid centers fall on the Blackfeet Reservation. So we're going to get these weather stations on steroids from them soon. Um, and yeah, so these USGS partnerships, I've had some handouts over there. Oh, it does work. Yeah. Uh, off screen. Yeah. You guys want to grab one of them on the way out. I printed like 30 of them now. And it really explains this partnership good with the USGS. They're, we're modeling everything after what they do, our hydrology program for um, surface water management and groundwater. But a lot of what we've been doing is gauge station work on uh, surface water on rivers. So we've got four new installs and um, they're all on tribal ranches. Uh, actually one is in, but we've got a, um, a, a deal worked out there where we're not worried about access. But um, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk more about those actually. Site assessment is uh, something I'm working on now. Uh, we're doing a Birch Creek study. It's um, the waters down in Birch Creek are, um, you know, we have all these different uh, partners and stakeholders surrounding the reservation. On the north, we have, you know, Canada, and uh, we, uh, we work on something called the International Joint Commission with the Canadians, and they really get their water down to the droplet up there. And so we're, you know, we're, we're working with them. And um, down south, though, we have the um, Ponderay County Canal and Reservoir Company. And, um, they have a lot of interest in, in their water and they've got a really good program going. They've got a um, uh, local boy, Lou Jones there, you know, vouching for them. And um, it was always a rocky, rough uh, relationship, but things have gotten a lot better. They got a new hydrologist in there now at PCCRC, Ponderay County, Canal and Reservoir Company. And um, he's been really good to work with. And, um, but at the same time, you know, he doesn't want to, um, have too great of a relationship or, you know, we're, we, we, were, we work together good though, but he's got to remember those good old boys that run his uh, show there and he's got to make sure that, that he keeps them happy, of course. And uh, so yeah, site assessments on Birch Creek is a big thing. That's what I've been doing lately is uh, driving down to Birch Creek, flying the drone around, uh, figuring out land access for a new, um, uh, site there, a new gauge station that'll be online and we'll get readings from it every uh, hour, however often we want to. And then uh, our snowpack measurement program is in development that uses um, Army Corps of Engineers. They'll, um, they won't have a snowpack uh, measurement device on their steroid system, but we have a we work with Eric Pike, she's the director of the CCME, and he's gonna um, uh, help us do some site assessment on a snowpack site here along the Glacier Park and Blackfeet border. And we are definitely open to going along the Badger Two Medicine and Birch Creek area too, because we, we need to capture those streams too. And how much water is coming on the reservation to do a proper water budget, how much is, coming in, how much is going out, and what's being used while it's here. <clears throat> uh, oh, this is just a little slide about um, why, why stream gauges. Um, you know, flow regimes, that's a word we throw around a lot. See what, what the river does throughout the year, and, and then try and figure out why, you know. Is it natural, is it because of this, that? Um, you know, so forecasting, uh, planning efforts for droughts and floods. Um, and then, uh, yeah, 
have water rights, of course, and determining if streams are for recreational activities, uh, okay, assessing what. Uh, yeah, so I, I mainly work with water quantity, more so than water quality in my position. We have another hydrologist on staff, and he's worked for the environmental office for a long time, and he um, handles more of the water quality, I would say. Although I have some experience with it. And then reservoirs, roads, bridges. Yeah, you know, just the engineering of everything. If we go to our engineers, they're at Billings, the first thing they're gonna want is a hydrograph on something. So I wanna put a gauge station out at Sweet Pine where Cut Bank Creek flows under Highway 89. And they're like, you know, you can't just be like, just put one here, you gotta, I'm building a hydrograph right now, so I gotta go jump in there all the time and um, plot it on a graph. And like right now we're rising, we're about at our peak of our hydrograph, a bell curve is a typical hydrograph. And we're peaking right about now, typically at the end of May and the beginning of June. So um, the, one of the only weightable sections of Cut Bank Creek is actually at that bridge. Even upstream to the park line, you can't weight it barely anywhere. It's cut bank for a reason, and those banks are steep, and mm -hmm. there's big holes and willows, and it's kind of a dangerous wave besides right at the, mm -hmm. right at the bridge there. And they have other ways you can uh, measure them besides jumping in there. Uh, you can use a, a cable cart, right? Have you guys ever seen those cable carts around? Mm -hmm. And then you need what they call an ABCP, and it's a boat that you uh, you take across the river and back. It's an acoustic uh, Doppler current profiler, and um, they're they're very accurate. And they use them on the big water, you know. And here we're where we're all these uh, tributaries are coming towards the big water and off the side a little bit. I've heard that's why the Old North Trail comes through here is because those old timers didn't want to cross way down there, but they could cross easily along the front. But we're here on the front and um, we rarely need an ADCP, that boat in the bank operated cable cart or an actual cable cart. But uh, other places um, where we don't have an actual cable cart you hop into, we have a bank operated cable cart where you attach your boat to a pulley and uh, crank it. So we don't actually have an ADCP yet, but when the USGS and the DNRC come around, they do, and we're, I'm working on ordering one right now. <laughs> so yeah, and then on the irrigation, uh, this I just took like two days ago, this picture, right when that smoke cleared a little and the mm -hmm. clouds came in, that was that day. And um, yeah, so this is the, this is Birch Creek, Birch Creek, mm -hmm. and this is the BIA canal. And it's the only canal coming out of Birch Creek flowing north that goes north onto the reservation. There's a bunch of them, Loeffler, B Canal, all these other canals that go south into the Ponderay County Canal and Reservoir Company. But this is kind of ours. And um, historically, they haven't actually measured the flow of this stream right here. And um, so, uh, like I was out there yesterday and or a couple days ago, and we measured it this day, it was only at 11 and a half CFS. Not very much. A cubic foot per second is about, if you imagine a basketball flowing by every second, 11 basketballs, like a wall of them. Hmm. And um, so, uh, but we're working on a Birch Creek report right now with the USGS. And um, last summer, we were gonna report that it was at 25 CFS all year. And so we were like, oh, did we screw up? I gotta go back. I think we might've messed up. Cause George took over the measurement, that's him standing there halfway through and I was like, I'm gonna put the drone up and I just taught him how to use the flow tracker and I was like, yeah, something might happen. And, but we went back there, I went back the next day and um, alone and I ran into the BIA canal people that opened those head gates and um, they, they verified you know, with me that we just opened it more. So I measured it again. They were shooting for 14 CFS when it was at 11 and a half. And then I, um, they were shooting for 30 CFS when they opened it more. I let it stabilize a while. And then I jumped in there, measured it, and it was at 26 and a half or so. So um, they've been kind of cutting our people, shortchanging us a little bit, probably for a lot of years, honestly. And because they, they go by inches of that they screw the thing up on the gate. And uh, there's two gates right here on the BIA canal. 
and one's malfunctioning. So this might be a water compact project coming up soon. Because if they were to get it up to 30 CFS down at the um, culvert down the road over here, it's almost topped out and it probably can't even handle 30 CFS. So this is what our water compact money is going to do, stuff like this. Uh, a lot of reservations there um, are tribes, their uh, water compact money um, went more for tribal projects. While this is BIA, we might be able to get BIA to pay for that. But um, that's something I think that's going to have to be done if the agreement was 30 CFS and uh, they got to they gotta jump it up. But they were they were really um, happy that to know what was actually flowing through there, you know, instead of like, oh, we put it up a couple inches and like, you know, we don't, we're not sure. And, and a lot of them are um, kind of abrasive to changing their ways <laughs> to uh, jumping in with a flow tractor, so. So yeah, with our irrigation, we have, uh, this is a BIA canal, but we also have Blackfeet canals that the BIA has nothing to do with. And uh, some of them are operating now, we have a few of them, but some of them are um, not operating and there might be good reason for that, but we need to look into it and figure out why. Maybe they just couldn't deliver water, the transmission rate they call it is um, how, what percent of your water gets from point A to point B, you know, along the way. <laughs> Even this canal loses a CFS from here to uh, six tenths of a mile down. And um, they, um, you know, line their um, canals with different things like bentonite or uh, just concrete. So um, different, uh, different places are using remotely controlled gates now. Um, they can be radio or satellite. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the future, and that's something that we're starting to look into, is these remote gates uh, at diversions, checks, and turnouts. There's some uh, irrigation terminology there that I'm learning about I didn't know much about before. And um, so yeah, we wanted to put in a measurement device here, not like just a typical gauge station. We were talking about putting in a flume or a weir, but we're gonna, we're gonna go with just a normal, normal old gauge station like we see on a lot of bridges and stuff here. <clears throat> but, but yeah, we're currently working on inventorying um, what, what's out there, what's old, what's new, what we're using still, and uh, making plans to rehabilitate some uh, different ditches. <clears throat> and um, let's see, here's a USGS slide. So this is a lot like the uh, handout that I brought over there. And uh, it kind of explains um, what's going on here. Uh, the, the Water Department and the USGS will work in collaboration to design and implement a data collection program that will potentially include miscellaneous continuous discharge measurements, streams, canals, installation of operations, sprinkle locations, stations, groundwater level training, data management. And um, yeah, so so that's, that's kind of where we're at right now is uh, still working with this USGS and we're going to continue to for a long time, and we're okay with that. So here's uh, out on Cut Bank Creek. These are some wells that are uh, seated right next to each other, and one of those four tribal ranch gauge stations I was talking about earlier are located uh, adjacent to this about 100 yards away. So uh, Gillum Cooley, um, is uh, the name of this one if you were to look it up on uh, the internet, the USGS gauge site is uh, named Gillum Cooley. It's at the Perry Ranch, uh, people might know it as, but it's up Durham Road north off Highway 2 on Seville Flat, a few miles. And, um, and yeah, this, uh, these are two different wellheads here. One's shallow and one's deep. And our gauge is over here. So what we're looking at is how the groundwater and the surface water interact seasonally and why. And uh, this is an ongoing study, and this is uh, something that we've been involving the community with, the community college, the environmental office, and um, it's just a cool project. Somebody could do a, you know, a really big project on the data that we're getting here. The deep well wasn't very productive at all. The shallow well is, is very productive. And um, so there's a couple different peaks you'll see in the different hydrographs. Uh, some come from the mountain snowmelt, 
well, some come from the prairie snow melt or uh, rain events, but mainly when the snow melts, we're seeing what it when it hits the groundwater and when it hits the gauge. And if there's no reason why the gauge went up based off of weather and um, different things happening in the here on the continental divide, we can um, infer that it came from the prairie because this is a big coulee and there's a lot of groundwater out on the prairie even though it might not look like there's much snow pack and, and you can deplete that groundwater so we're starting to look at at ground uh, groundwater levels all over and people have they've been doing it here a long time we're not just starting that but we're still doing it and we're trying to get a better data set going and then birch trick, I think I actually talked about this quite a bit already, but um, DNR season on it because they're they're representing the state, um, and USGS is um, we're we're all working together, I guess. But um, so we did some synoptic runs last summer where uh, a bunch of us got together with our flow trackers and we all measured the whole entirety of Birch Creek in one day. And um, so we all had like four different sites assigned to us, and we um, were able to tell them if um, there were what the surface water and groundwater interactions were like on a birch trip. And uh, a synoptic run is also known as a seepage run. So uh, that some of the times the surface water will seep into the groundwater, and um, the hyperheic zone they call that, and other it can also upwell into the surface water, and that's very um, common as well. Just as common as it going down, it'll come up other places. So these synoptic runs are useful for, um, you know, knowing like, oh, are they taking more water than out of that canal? Then, you know, it just gives you a way better understanding of, uh, of what's happening there. And it's, um, so we're, we're trying to figure out these, these hyperheat zones. And uh, so, and that's the flow regime, you know, in-stream flows, diversions, gaining and losing reaches, and trying to get everything to add up and make sense, you know. Um, you know, and see, here's what I, this slide is out of date, huh? but see, steady rate of 26.14, I averaged those out from last summer's um, synoptic runs or seepage runs, and, um, but I jumped in there a few days ago and it was at 11 and a half. So it, it turns out that they kind of stage it up a little bit uh, in that canal, the BIA does, our tribe. Um, well, the BIA on behalf of our tribe. So, um, so yeah, we're looking for somewhere to, to put in a gauge down way, that way to get a better understanding on the south side of the reservation on Birch Creek. And um, so anyways, here's a drown shot. You guys, Ever been there? Where is it? <laughs> oh, I'm blo I've been blocking you this whole time. Well, um, it's Swift Dam, yep. Yeah. Oh. Yep, yeah, there's a road right there. And um, yeah, here's Birch Creek. And so I've been trying to get a few photos. We have a, a publication coming up uh, about this whole uh, Birch Creek study. And um, I was tasked with getting some photos, so I've been been working on that a bit here and there. Um, also working on some technical working groups. I mentioned earlier the IJC International Joint Commission. Uh, there's a climate and hydrology technical working group I'm a part of and meet with them bi-weekly. Um, also there's an indigenous advisory group. Um, I'm a part of that as well. And um, that's working with the stakeholders up north in the Milk River and St. Mary's drainages. Um, also the Crown Snowpack Modeling Technical Working Group and Advisory Group. We, um, we work with them a little bit on this model that they're creating. Um, and um, it, it's to, uh, yeah, just see what the future snowpack outlooks might be. So um, like when we, when I first joined the group, they weren't even going to include the Blackfeet Reservation and they were also going to disclose parameters such as wind speed and direction. And I was like, those are pretty important to us here and uh, also could you include the entirety of the reservation? Because they're focused on the crown, which is like water tin and glacier kind of, right? 
And then uh, mainly, but of course it goes down to like Missoula almost, depending on who you talk to. But um, they included the whole Flathead Reservation because they had somebody there representing vouching for that. And, and they started hiring some people finally with the Blackfeet Water Department and sending them to these meetings. So I was first thing I was like, well, hey, how about uh, we include our res and <laughs> like maybe the women didn't thing over on the west side, but uh, it is here and it plays a huge part in where the snow <laughs> ends up, <laughs> deposits, and it's just blowing all over. And so, so we're you know hopefully gonna learn something, glean some knowledge from that. IJC, yeah, International Joint Commission, and uh, I uh, snagged this slide from Rodney Caldwell, my co-worker over there at the USGS. Well, yeah, so um, you can see here um, what's going on. This is just the, the Milk River and the St. Mary's here, and there's a siphon here where the water is siphon out of the St. Mary's and into the Milk River to supply farmers down this way to Fresno Reservoir near Haver. So um, yeah, these are really old treaties, 1909, 1921, and some things happened there where um, we took the water out of the St. Mary's River. Well, we, USGS, um, United States, got the water out of the St. Mary's River and put it into the melt to farm the High Line. And then, um, but the melt goes back up north over the border. So then the Canadians built a ditch out of that they call it a spike ditch and so then everything's kind of equaled out in the end and we're all trying to kind of work together on that but i heard it was kind of ugly back in 1909 or 10 or 12 whatever the spike ditch and all that was built but um but yeah there's a it's a really complicated uh water compact um, all around there's different water compacts with different um entities like the tribe has one with the united states government i think the forest service has one with United States government, Glacier does, and and everybody, all the different uh, stakeholders do. Oh, this is, uh, I think, going to be the cover of that um, snow modeling report when it is complete. So we got a mini glacier, huh? Let's see, uh, so Four Horns, uh, this is a little before my time. Um, but uh, the Blackfeet Water Department did have a big part in um, in uh, the creation of this new dam here at Four Horns. It's supposed to hold a lot more water, and part of it goes works in with the Birch Creek Agreement, where this water goes down down to Birch Creek eventually. Even though it comes out of Badger, they take it out of the basin and then put it in the Birch down south. And of course, to go off the reservation, honest, you know, so. So this uh, badger water is even going all the way down to Pottery County. Bigger and bigger now. So yeah, this is a uh, this is a new uh, animation. Well, I've been talking about it for a while now. I guess it makes that new. It's pretty cool though. I was really excited when this came out. But uh, this is the current Saint Mary Diversion Dam, and this is what it's going to look like. Um, you can walk over along this crumbly concrete right now to this fishing hole right here. <laughs> Caught fish in here too though. Nothing ever up here, I don't get it. But this will be the fish return you'll see, so I'm excited to <laughs> the there's, fishing spot. There's actually a movie about it. I'm wondering if it'll play on that. Okay, I don't know if I have the power to do it from here. I'll see if I can. <laughs> so this is a six minute uh, silent film, so I, feel free to talk amongst yourselves or do whatever, bathroom break, this is kind of an intermission. <laughs> Yeah, this oh. is 
Putting water into the milk yeah. from the same area. Mm -hmm. It goes to Camp Nine, where that hooks hideaway place is. <laughs> Acting like I've never been there. Never been there I think that was a lot to do with it because that a lot of that's a fish ladder. That whole area there is all for the fishes. Like it shouldn't, it wouldn't have to be that big if it weren't for the bull trout and the Endangered Species Act. It turns out the West Slope cutthroat trout of this area are, um, you know, about as endangered, if not more, than uh, the bull trout. But, but um, this is the the West Slope cutthroat trout of this area. Are, uh, there's a lot of bull trout here, whereas there's not a lot of bull trout everywhere. And uh, there's not a lot of uh, pure strain West Slope cutthroat, though. And um, there, yeah, and, and there is some strongholds in this area, but uh, the, I think a lot of the concern and funding definitely came from the bull trout and endangered species act. Mm -hmm. So they got it. Oh, no, I don't think they're going <laughs> to. They're, they're pretty happy with uh, <laughs> the different populations, and they are able to get through here up and down, which is something I did not know until recently. But the bull trout have always been able to get through the old diversion dam, but not very well. But the populations up in the upper lake, up, or lower St. Mary's, I mean, and um, uh, Kennedy Creek and Lower St. Mary's River um, have been able to co uh, or interbreed and all that. Where is that? It's uh, at the Bath Bridge and Bath Flat over the St. Mary's River. Oh. Uh, don't some of life have to be like dark sky? Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how final this whole. Uh, um, designs, but I was able to go to a bull trout meeting down in Billings about a month ago and got uh, educated on all this, and it was pretty exciting. Uh, Jeremiah North Pagan is the um, fisheries biologist with the tribe that's been doing a lot of this work, along with Buzz Cabell, of course, the director. Andrew Gillum did a lot of this work too on uh, his master's thesis. And uh, he was at that meeting, but he works for the US Fish Wildlife Service, but he's gonna be heading up a lot of this uh, bull trout project alongside um, Jeremiah North Pagan, it sounds like. And he's uh, he's from this area originally, so that'll be cool. He lives in Bozeman, I believe now. So this is kind of new newish to me for the tribe. You have uh, two hydrologists, mm -hmm. fisheries biologists, and what else? <laughs> oh, well, the bi fisheries is under Fish and Wildlife. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's not, oh, yeah. not tribal. No, they're uh, Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife Department. Oh, right, mm -hmm. right, right. Okay, they are well, tribal. That is so yeah. cool. Yeah. Because that didn't used to exist, I don't think, on the reservation. Yeah, the, Jeremiah is the first fisheries biologist, I think, for Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just figured that Andrew would have been the service and then said, I'm going to get to the president, fisheries biologist. Or at least recently, anyway. And then, uh, is it uh, Hawk, Elijah? Or no? Elliot? Elliot Hawk. I think he does some of this work on the north side of the border with Jeremiah. I think the canal is still going to carry about, uh, it was designed
designed for 900 CFS, but it actually takes about 700 CFS. Oh. I think they might do some repairs, but um, some of that, you know, seepage, a lot of aquifers have now relied on canal seepage. So, uh, Tyrell, I think watching your little silent film here, I finally figured out how those fish screens work, right? Like that whole green kind of post, right, lets water go through to the what's now the near side, and it funnels the fish down the screen up that little yeah. tube back to the, the stream so that you don't have fish getting caught down the diversion ditch. Yeah, part of it said fish screen and cleaners. So I didn't know if they're, I don't think they were talking about cleaning the fish. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they just do a little, little hand scrub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then how do they back up? Don't they back up? I think it's that gap right there. Uh, there there's ways. Apparently, and I, I was still a lot, I still don't fully understand it. But even before this new design, they were able to get through that dam. They could definitely get down, you know, jumping over. I think the primary concern was there was a lot of kid, a lot of bull trout and cutthroat trout uh, that died at the siphon. So not mm -hmm. in the canal, but once they made it all the way down to the siphon, that's what was killing them. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to prevent bull trout and cutthroat from Yeah, there's a few siphons on the reservation. That one's huge. <laughs> there's one under Kennedy Creek before it gets there, the canal. It, it goes under there. What would you call that siphon? I guess. And then Two Medicine uh, BIA Canal does the same thing on Joshua East, where it, it kind of goes up and down, and the pressure behind it just keeps it rolling, I guess. Are there, are there um, dams in there or something in there that authorizes the fishing from the whole group? Oh, the fish? Or it's just oh. Like, just oh. Like, a, like an overgrown culvert. Mm -hmm. I think there's uh, some kind of turbines in the within the dam. Okay, that, that would not be healthy. No, I don't, I don't know if that's all for power generation, but they still have them in these dams anyways. But uh, yeah, back a little bit back to the, uh, the water department, and I'll get right into some on climate adaptation. So uh, we just do some community outreach. This is on Pepe Creek uh, at that gauge near the wells. Um, and this is, these are VCC students here and some environmental office people, folks and a um, uh, mix of everybody. And recently we had another hydrology day on Pepe Creek. So we've been um, working on um, some community outreach here and there. Um, and then, you know, just database is something that everybody does and we're trying to figure out because there's a lot of uh, old files and things like that. We need to get digitized and on the cloud, on the hard, everywhere, you know, have it backed up. So um, water permits and GIS data primarily. Uh, so yeah, some mapping. Uh, I've been working a little bit on building a Blackfeet canal layer. So like, um, yeah, this is, uh, okay, well, <clears throat> okay, yeah, that's Cutbank Creek, sorry. And uh, I think th this is a uh, flat iron that goes into browning there. They took a fork of the Cutbank Creek and ran it straight to browning actually a long time ago. And that was Flatiron Creek. So, uh, and that's a canal. It's supposed to water the skate park area, actually. And so we try to get water there, but people uh, like turn off and on these uh, open up and closed gates all the time. So it's something that we're having to deal with here, like security issues. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we have help too, besides me, there's uh, 
Yeah. Uh, your engineering department, Dowell, they do a lot of mapping as well. This is just something I mess around with one time. <coughs> but it's a it's a Black Sea Canals layer, whereas they only have BI canals. There's really isn't a Black Sea Canals layer existing. So it'll be a good thing to have. Uh, yeah, and then permitting, of course. Here's that awesome gauge, one of the oldest in the country there, Manny Glacier. And this is when I worked as a avalanche watch up there, so that was really early in the season there. You see that waterfall though coming off Logan Pass. But yeah, uh, part of the permitting is uh, some of the um, non-tribal members that have water permits on the reservation, they're um, held through the state, so we have to, um, um, actually, no, sorry, it's tribal members that have state-held water rights that we have to convert to a tribal permit, and that's something I'm luckily getting away from. Okay, here we go. Climate adaptation. <laughs> Drought resiliency. Yeah, so this is the willow woven snow fence that um, we have over at the high school, and you can actually see all three in this picture. So it's a snow lab, you could say, because this is a... a Two different designs here besides the woven willow. Uh, wood slab and plastic netting, if you got a better look at that. And that's the stuff you always see along the road that's usually orange, but uh, this is green. Um, so these are uh, dir dir upwind directly from the new high school in Browning, which is to the west. And uh, so the woven willow features uh, tribal ecological knowledge. Um, uh, woven willows use in uh, different ceremonies and uh, building structures very often on the Blackfeet Reservation. And um, so when it was time to build some snow fences, it only came natural to be like, well, let's do a woven willow one, right? And that's where that came from. We did like two foot apart stud willows here and then wired them to our frame and then just went weaving. It was really fun. The students, high school students, everybody got in on weaving some of these willows and pounding some of these posts. Uh, Termaine Edmo, yeah, uh, she helped one time before this one was even up. These two were up, and the uh, fence was blown at like a forty-five degree or more angle down to the ground, and we um, we had to stand it up and um, brace it so we didn't know when we designed these that we would need braces, but we definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this is out on the BCC's campus. It's actually the largest tribal college uh, land-based wise in the country, Blackfeet Community College, like 750 acres, I think. So this is um, on the other side of town, basically. People don't know it's part of the campus, but it is. And uh, so this is our one that's actually directly recharging a wetland, whereas the other ones behind the high school were uh, just there to see what the snow drifts would look like when they deposited. And uh, they generally form a belt, not a belt, a half a teardrop form, however you want to say that. And, um, you know, I could say that uh, there's some equations that go into this too. See how there's a gap behind here where there's no snow? Yeah. The snow drift starts a little ways behind the um, structure because there's a foot of gap here and that allows for the wind to blow it clean through there. And um, some people might say it's about 10 feet for every one foot gap you have here. So maybe 10x. And then the height is six feet and then the fetch of the snow drift goes back however far, and that's about 20 or 30 times the height of your fence. Mm -hmm. So we put these up wind of a road or a wetland and can place that snow drift exactly where you want it, depending on um, you know those things, how high is your fence, and uh, do you have a gap under it. And those are the two main things to, oh, and also 50% porosity. See how that's designed to be 50% there? We just went to weaving on this to where we thought it might be about 50%. That uh, plastic netting is designed with those holes in it to be exactly 50%. So that's kind of the magic number if you're wanting to collect snow. Did you find one worked better than the other? Or? 
Yeah, that's what the snow labs were for, and they were all, you know, it seemed like the 50% frosty was, you know, they were all about the same. And um, what the main factors were um, was kind of placement, like how close you want it to your, um, to your wetland. Like we thought that maybe the tail end of them hanging out into the wetland would have been okay, but I would, wouldn't be opposed to getting it almost right up on your wetland, like about 30 feet away rather than 100 feet away. Whereas, see this one, there was a wetland down this way. See, these are supposed to gauge how deep they were. And um, the fall wave of the snowdrift was coming more this way than right along there. We orientated our snow fences at about 340 degrees. So we thought they'd be kind of going along the Rocky Mountain front rather than straight north and south, zero or 360 degrees. We knew it wouldn't be right. So we angled them towards it a little bit, but I would say angle them even more, like 320. So there's a, a lot of things we learned about on this, these snow labs. Blue time. This is just that really cool video that's very pertinent to what we're all talking about tonight. And it's only two minutes, one minute. <laughs> it's got sound. Oh yeah, sound, of course. Oh no. That's so. a Oh no, we're, we, we'll be okay without these videos. If there's, oh no. Oh. What are, oops, sorry. I don't want to do that. Magical space bar is not used. <laughs> I was just kidding, slide. <laughs> yeah, you guys should watch this So, Life in the Land, uh, it's a series about different parts of the state, and uh, one of them was uh, set here in, on the Blackfeet Nation, and um, in here, uh, they just, we just talk about the snow fences, and also regenerative grazing, though, which is another uh, thing that we're doing here to combat our uh, drought that we've been experiencing. And I've got a slide for that. But this is the students here. The, uh, this is out at uh, the community college land there um, east of town. We did a combination here, change it up a little. Our plastic netting is starting to blow apart, so I think we need to just throw some willows up right there. The wood slat, um, they, kids were climbing all over that, it's fine. <laughs> but this, uh, we should take that plastic out and put in some uh, woven willow. But a uh, really impressive drift, and a lot of this was see where it was situated. There's a high hill here, it's not high, I mean it's a hill. Here's a hill, and there's a dip here, and snow naturally deposits there, but this just gave it a huge jump on uh, how much water it's gonna store. Won't that willow regenerate and start to become live willows? We haven't noticed that yet, but uh, yeah, we've thought about trying to do that intentionally. I've, I've pulled up a number of them. Yeah. Got them in the ground, little suckers just grow like crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this would be the time of year, you think? Or Good idea. Can you do it later in the year? Or just kind of, as long as you got soil moisture? As long as you got some water. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be like growing your own snow fish, right? Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah, they have. Grow the mm -hmm. rice and we can sell all the It's like string restoration. They put willows yeah. along strings to oh, restore yeah. it. So of course, like if willow were to do that, that would be amazing because it's using, like you said, tribal ecological knowledge that is really vital and important, you know? Yeah. Oh, we saw that one. Oh, there's Doug Lomery now on Seville Flat. So here's uh, a regenerative grazing site that um, I should have threw a PLHI um, uh, emblem up there. But uh, this was uh, during my work with PLHI, Cutting Lodge Health Institute. And um, uh, so anyways, Doug Warren's a rancher out on Seville Flat. And he's, um, he's really into uh, doing progressive uh, ranching techniques and he's just all on board with regenerative grazing. And, and he does a bunch of other types of agriculture, hoga culture or zoo culture. He'll 
he'll do all kinds of um, things to just to see what happens. He's a kind of math scientist guy there. Yeah, he's, he's a really cool guy. Um, and uh, so this is uh, one of his, you can see it was grazed through here. And that's his electric fence. It's a poly wire and you can train your livestock to that. And they'll, they'll respect the wire, even though it's even just one. And it's so easy to move around that you can set up these different paddocks in your pasture and rotate them daily, maybe every three days, maybe every week. But they say the more you rotate them, the better, or the, um, yeah, more results you're gonna have as far as forage goes. And uh, so there's ranches that are seeing like five and 600% forage in this area, not on the reservation that we've seen personally, but um, near us in Cascade, uh, there's ranch down there, um, seed and livestock. They're doing really good things. They're really innovative, even though they're, um, I don't know. Yeah, they're uh, just one of the oldest ranches in the state. And they're doing it, they're getting five and 600% um, you know, return on it. And they're, they're finding ways where people that are having to give up the ranch and things like that, they're looking at regenerative grazing real hard now. And um, so yeah, it improves uh, uh, soil moisture, uh, productivity, health of the animals. It's, it's just an all around win-win-win situation. And um, people are starting to see it a lot more and more, especially with our, uh, that Life in the Land video that came out, it's been mm -hmm. shown quite a bit. And, um, and yeah, you, you guys should check that out. Stories for Action is the company that uh, put those videos mm -hmm. together. And um, Life in the Land is the series. Boom. So yeah, wrapping up. Um, so more, instrument, more instrumentation is the main thing that I'm involved with right now. I've been out uh, doing a lot of site assessments, trying to get more gauges up and trying to quantify the water as it comes in, as it goes out, and what's happening while it's on the land here on the nation. So we're uh, wanting to put in more and more instrumentation, give it time. And uh, that can, includes gauges. That is how you spell gauges at USGS, by the way. People try to correct me. There, you can Google that and they, USGS dedicated a whole website or webpage to why they spell it that way. There's a big history to it, I can't remember that. But the, the USGS, uh, people uh, like, uh, edit my stuff and correct that every time. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Weather station. So snow, snowpack measurement program is what we really want to get into. And, um, you know, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, snow tail sites are really expensive. They use a pillow. Whereas uh, you can, that gives you the snow water equivalent. Whereas if you just use a sonic ranging device, that'll tell you the distance down to anything the ground where it's seeing it all year and then as the snow piles up it'll tell you how far it is to that snow mm -hmm. and then people can kind of estimate SWE off the off weather reports mm -hmm. and um, surrounding snow tell actual snow tell sites so snow tell sites might be a bit cost prohibitive but we can throw a sonic ranging device on pretty easy they're like two hundred dollars and um, mm -hmm. wired into your data logger and you're good but yeah, the water budget is the main thing I want to work on personally. A lot of it in the water compact, it says it's in stone that the um, tributary feeder streams, streams all along the front from uh, Birch Creek up to Chief Mountain, the Blackfeet have all of the excess water after the state gets there right downstream, which might be down off the reservation. And then, uh, like Many Glacier Hotel, um, you know, uh, Lake, or not Lake Nevada, but the hotels, they, Forest Service has some water rights as well after all those are met. But what do we do with all this excess water, you know? And, and part of it also says that we can only keep it as in stream flow. So it, it's, you know, it's kind of a deal where it's like, huh, well, that wasn't a great deal because we could have like stored it somewhere or something, you know? And that's part of the reason why, you know, we should have been measuring water a long time ago until just starting this. And, um, but yeah, all that excess water in the, all these tributary streams, all like 500 of them or whatever there is, or at least 100, from Birch to Chief Mountain, everyone you could think of, Cataract, uh, Rose Creek, just 
name any random stream, kill them quick or or kill them horse or something down that way. And <laughs> all the way from this whole area adjacent there, it was the seated strip, right? You know, and the reservation used to go all the way up to the Continental Divide, and it was um, it's now the seated strip, anyways. Now they go peak to peak, and uh, so that's no longer part of the reservation, but. Part of the water compact was that we do have that excess water belongs to us, and what we're going to do with it, I don't know, we can definitely keep it in stream, which that's good. We're going to keep the fish wet and everything else that lives in there. <laughs> so at least we, we'll do that, and I still want to do the water budget anyways. I just, you know, we're not going to get rich or whatever off uh, off that, but that's all right. We're, uh, we basically guaranteed in-stream flows now, and, and um, and that's that's the black sheep, so you know, kind of contribution there, part part of it. Anyways, uh, discharge measurement, um, yeah. So we want something on the BIA canals, we're saying, and um, the snow fence installs. I talked to somebody the other day, and uh, she's got an old lake down here. You guys uh, <coughs> going to town uh, south of the highway from here to Browning, and. Um, she says the railroad built it so that the, the tribe won't help them rehabilitate it, but it uh, it's drying up, but it has mice shrimp in it, which is why all the fish get huge on the reservation, those little shrimp. And the fishing is world class out here in these prairie potholes because those shrimp are present. It has them, and it used to have big fish too, but she says it's drying up. And uh, so that's going to be the next target for some snow fences. And uh, so, yeah, remote gates, snow fences, and... Um, We've come into a lot of tribal ranches recently with the water compact money. I believe about 60 million of it was uh, delegated for that purpose. Um, most of them were non-member ranches built up. I don't know if that was uh, part of the plan or anything, but the um, way it was. So um, we've got a lot of ranches and uh, we're looking to stock some soon. And I would like to, you know, see some regenerative grazing go on there myself. And um, it looks like, um, we're to the end of our slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, there's two major BIA canals on the red, or three, sorry. Um, but yeah, they're, they're separate than the Black Sheep Canal. The BIA canals um, are, are um, have a much longer history and they deliver a lot more water. Uh -huh. They have a lot of employees working for them, um, cleaning them and, um, and operating and maintaining them. And, uh, and there is a BIA office in Browning and they, they all work out of there for the government. Of the U.S., right. whereas our canals are for the tribe, okay. and they're much smaller and not as much staff. Right. But they are delivering water still, and there's some that we want to rehabilitate. Mm -hmm. The CCC came through in the '30s and went wild digging mm -hmm. ditches, and mm -hmm. some of those maybe did never get lined very well and don't have a great transmission rate oh. of delivery. They might lose all the water by the time it gets to where it's going. <laughs> but we're going to look at that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Seville Flat is where a lot of it goes with the Two Medicine Canal. That goes out of the basin too. They bring that over Mission Lake, a gap in the hills there, and they bring it out of the Two Medicine from Highway 89 upstream a little bit, is where that diversion had gated. And then it uh, goes up over the hill to Seville Flat by Mission Lake around the head of that lake. And then it um, delivers a ton of water up there. They've got an issue there. There's um, the um, 
bank is giving way on their canal and the uh, river uh, switched channels and it's now cutting away at the at the um, canal bank and it could like go at any time actually but there's not a whole lot of danger involved in that it's not like a dam breaking or anything but it, it would make a pretty big mess <laughs> <laughs> and they have pumps in mission lake for when that happens they're ready for it but there's bia funding takes forever for them to come and fix this and they're they got to survey it 20 times and get engineers out there and a bunch but they've known about it for quite a few years like five years or so and they're just kind of like yeah i'd like go <laughs> How much does downstream water rights enter into your day-to-day -day activities or the tribe's activities with water? Like I'm, I'm thinking back when you talked about these guys turning the gates to turns and you know, out of just how much water is going in and out. Do you have to keep track of how much goes out to be sure that everybody downstream has their water? Yeah, on the canals that, um that I have been helping out with a little bit recently, those BIA canals, just to help them gauge how much water's going out. Um, yeah, I, I feel like they haven't delivered the full quantity of water that um, might have been uh, allocated downstream if it was 30 CFS and they've only been getting about 26. But I think they're starting to get on board a little bit after meeting them yesterday or the day before. They were like, no way. They're like, can we call you anytime? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I think they're going to all start packing flow trackers. <laughs> can I ask you a little bit more about the regenerative grazing and more specifically, what, it, what, is it, what are they doing exactly? Yeah, so the basic idea is this is another form of TDK, uh, tribal or traditional ecological knowledge. You could look at it as like uh, bison mimicry, how they got beaver mimicry, like Tremaine talked about. So the bison didn't have fences and they just kind of went where they wanted and they would hit a place hard. And um, so it's, what is it, high impact grazing followed by a long period of rest. And that's kind of how you can explain how the bison moved over the prairie just intensive grazing everywhere they go. They might not be back there for a really long time, but the hoof action, and there's a lot of other things, you know, like disposal manure, and they're, the way they feed too, they, they weren't too selective. Um, whereas if you have cows penned up, they, they or how is it, um, when, when you do pen them up, they um, aren't as selective because they eat everything. They'll pick a spot and they'll eat on it and they'll kind of just stand there after it and be like, all right, next spot, let that happen, or, you know, and realize it might not. But they get moved from paddock to paddock. And so you can get under undesirable species when you um, also have them in a huge fenced in area because they'll target what they want and then leave the undesirables and then they'll proliferate. Mm -hmm. On the other end of that, when you do put them into a confined area like a paddock, you can get them to eat things that are actually palatable earlier in the spring, such as cheatgrass. They call it that because it um, seeds earlier and it has an advantage over the other plants, the other grass species. And it's, it chokes them later in the year because these, these uh, seeds are huge. And it's like you mess with their gut. Yeah. So, but it's palatable in the spring, so you can actually put a paddock on that in the springtime and get them to um, eradicate that. Wow. So you can get your cows to work for you. <laughs> this electric fence, it's really easy to move around and set up. And yeah. Cool. Yeah. Just a minute, I have some friends in Uganda who are doing that with chickens and orphans. They're using large um, walls fence wall and they move that around on a like seven acre plot. Mm. The chickens get to graze here for three days and then they move them over here and and they're pooping and, and regenerating the grass and stuff and the, and the so then you get um, um, range fed eggs. Oh wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's it, it's a really neat thing that whole farm of working that Yeah, it's a year. 
so it's uh, it takes a while to get going with your uh, increased forage. You're gonna see from what I've heard mainly, but um, but yeah, after a few years is when people really start seeing results. So if you uh, you know a lot of uh, land, like say you're driving towards Great Falls and you're going south on 89, mm -hmm. looks really overgrazed, right? Would that work for that land that's already been really overgrazed? Yeah, I think if, if they gave it like a recovery period of a few years okay. before mm -hmm. stocking it, and then the paddocks don't have to be that small, but it, um, yeah, I would, uh, you know, like acres, like maybe 50 acre paddocks or something out of that area, just throwing a number out there. Like a pretty large area, but not not that small. Like, I think would be somewhere good to start. And we we had some um, pilot sites that we've done this on, like um, the slide that I showed there. And he's he's starting to see some results for sure by now. Doug Ward, he's been out in a few years. We've uh, had some rockier places that um, I haven't actually seen the results. I um, didn't go back out there last summer, but. Uh, I don't, I don't know if they had great success. They were mainly trying to eradicate cheatgrass at another site. But Doug Roaring was kind of the uh, the main uh, pilot site for PLHI's uh, regenerative grazing work that I was part of. And uh, since I've been with the tribe, I haven't been a part of that. Yeah. Just a little bit here and there, but not really. I heard that ranch down in Central Valley used to bring up the number of years and had had really great success. And I think it was also based on the theory of like bunching. If you, and, and when the wildlife had, or when the cattle had predators and the predators would try and move them around and bunch them. And so they were mm. really trying to recreate that. And the man in Africa was afraid of uh, animals. So was so did we. Mm, the one skilled man working with um, our, um, Tom from Billings, from um, Tender Mercy Wilson, and Sister Mary, somebody else. The man in um, safety has been advocating for that kind of thing for years. There, there are a number of those self-sustaining farms in in that area of Uganda. It's just you know, around, hmm. around snowpack in our basin and you see those reports all the time where it's like we're usually maybe around 110 percent here maybe sun river tetons like 95 right. there's we're off a 30-year average not uh the whole historical data set of like 120 years or whatever we have it's a 30-year average so if we went 120 years we'd probably all definitely be below 100 percent except for in <laughs> sierra nevada or wherever they might have <laughs> actually broke 100% of the whole historical data set because it even says it on those charts usually in fine train it'll say 30 year average yeah. well they went back uh, to 1950 oh okay <laughs> so they actually said that from 1950 to now the highest level that was ever measured actually was 1987 mm -hmm. I'm a wonk I can't help it uh. <laughs> Yeah. What do you think the relationship is going to be between like DIA and the Wasco 
water department needs to come, especially since CIA is like a federal thing, and the Black Sea Water Department is just for our people. Well, they have these deals where we can take over federal departments, and I'm new to this whole like uh, side of the deal about um, I can't remember what they call it. There's a code for it though, Dylan. Six thirty eight. Six thirty. We can six thirty eight. Six thirty eight. We can six thirty eight. PIA <laughs> can all if we want. They should. Some of those workers might not like that as much if they get a pay cut or benefits or as well, <laughs> um, oh, things like that. But um, yeah, we could definitely 638 of any time we want, I feel, I think. <laughs> so would that be what they did with the roads? Like, <laughs> that were VIA roads are now tribal roads? No. Or keep it. Yeah. Um, where else did they 638 stuff? The environmental office did EPA. So a lot of their funding was EPA, not the tribe. Okay. And um, so it gets kind of complicated, but. It was pretty cool what I saw the other day going out there and they were happy that I was there to measure that and tell them what was going on. And um, so I'm interested to see where that relationship goes. And I think it's gonna result right away in that road getting torn out and a bigger culvert getting put in there that can actually handle that 30 CFS. Some people say you don't even want your water going halfway over the, or halfway point of the culvert. Yeah, and that thing is like, 80% full at 26 CFS, 30 CFS, and I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> Tyrell, Ter I got one last question for you. Thanks for coming and sharing about your work, and it's really interesting to hear a lot of the projects you have going on. Um, one question I, have, I know you're still working on building your, the data set, but what, from what you know from both your time and, and prior measurements, how have you seen or are seeing any changes in? Um, both timing of runoff and, and total volume of, of stream flow. Um, and are we seeing any trends here in the area that you're that you're aware of in terms of changing water availability or timing mm -hmm. of runoff? Yeah, there's um, on the my main source for that is the USGS website where you can uh, look at different hydrographs. They even have uh, different ones that you can look at that just show the different peaks for each year. And so there's anomalies always like 1964, right? Right. Huge flood, devastated the people. Uh, one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the state. So that hasn't happened again since then. Uh, Swift Dam broke, Two Medicine Dam broke and flooded us out. Uh, but yeah, since, since then, there hasn't been a flood like that. 2000, I think 11 was another kind of anomaly year. And, um, but so I haven't been studying those historic trends as much as I um, will have here in like the next few months, especially after this question. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be ready next, next time. Sounds good. <laughs> I'll ask you at the end of the summer. Hey, Tara, yeah. how did you learn? <laughs> no, uh, one of the coolest pieces of tribal ecological knowledge I learned, it's just from the west side, but they have a snow patch called the Heart of the Monster over on the, in Jocko Valley, mm -hmm. on the west side. Oh, yeah. When that snow patch no longer looks like an anatomical heart, not like a Hallmark heart, it starts melting. It's right by Dancing Boy. I, um, that signaled the time for safe crossings of the river for the Salish people. Mm -hmm. So it was like an ancient Salish gauge they had there. Mm -hmm. And they cross the river's horseback to come east, usually to hunt buffalo. And so when the heart of the monster uh, uh, mounted, it signaled that. So I've been looking for similar stories. I mm. uh, went to that Crown Managers Partnership Forum in Browning, and they have a really cool snow patch up north that looks like a bison skull. It is something about um, buffalo calving season. And uh, on going to the Sun Mountain, there's that, it looks like a warrior with a laid back headdress. And, um, you know, looking for some stories and I'm, you know, uh, ethnohydrography, I've heard it called. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so as far as these data sets go, I always go with the peak flows, usually the end of this month or the beginning of June. And it seems like it's been pretty spot on like that as far as all these old data sets even go. 
but there is, um, you know, uh, less water, groundwater, people are pumping groundwater and uh, those keep that base flow going in your streams out downstream. So I feel like they're see, we're seeing less flows downstream, but upstream, I know the glaciers are definitely melting, you know, there's, there's gotta be less flows yeah. all around. And the, but the peak hydrographs seem to be about the same time of year, like right now, like in the next week, in two weeks. Well, how long have you been using it? The, the flow tracker? Yeah. Not long. So, like but the USGS has been doing this for a long time and on the reservation, they have old established sites all over the reservation. Some have been abandoned, some are old, some are newer but they've had a lot of sites on the reservation. Right now there's about 15 of them that are online constantly logging data. And uh, that's where we go out and measure out to make sure that they're given good data. So whenever they come around every 68 weeks, I go out with them. And then in between that, I, I go out here and I do a lot of computer work too, though, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tyrell. Thank you. Mm -hmm.